you have a Bible, go ahead and open with me to Genesis 42. Now, by show of hands, how many of you uh, are runners in the room? How many of you once a week, you know, a couple times a week run? Just keep those hands up. Put them up high. We'll, let us see them. All right, all right. I see a few hands here. Now, now, keep them up. Keep them up for a moment. Everybody else, do me a favor. Look around the room. These are people we cannot trust. All right, well, these are people we have no right to trust. I think it's Proverbs 28, 1 that says that the wicked flee when no one pursues to them. And I think that is a life verse for me. Maybe for, not for you, but it is for me that, that, look, why are you running? Who's chasing after you? If you're not in trouble, if there's not a lion come after you, what are you doing? All right, I, I cannot stand to run. And so this illustration will only go so far, but give me a little bit of grace here, and uh, I think you'll catch the point. Uh, running as awful as it is, is a sport. I think it's more torture, but whatever, we'll call it a sport. And so when you're running, there's a lot of strategy, there's a lot of science to it. You gotta know your own body, you gotta know the the course and the route and the race and all those different things. There's a ton of things, in fact, to actually know about running and racing. But there's one thing that if you get this one thing wrong, it doesn't matter how much you know, it doesn't matter how much you studied, ultimately, you will not run a good race. And it's this. It's how you pace yourself. You don't want to start off too fast and not be able to, to finish and, and burn out before you, you get to the finish line and, and, and end up burning up and not having any more energy before you're able to cross the finish line. Maybe you catch a cramp and you just fall down. EMS pulls you off. Everyone throws you on social media. Like, nobody wants that. All right? And so that's one option if you start too fast, too hard, too strong. But the other option is uh, you, you save too much energy and you finish the race and you still got more left in the tank. That's not a win either. You want to almost come to the end of the finish line collapsing. You want to pace yourself. In fact, from a running article I read last night, physiologically, the most efficient way to run a long distance race is that an even pace with a fast finish. That's the goal, an even pace with a fast finish. And as we've been walking through the book of Genesis, we have been going at an even pace, a slow pace. It's sometimes it has felt like a snail's pace. We have been here for a year and a half. But over the next three weeks, we are going to go full sprint and leave everything we have left in the tank out on the course as we finish the book of Genesis. Now, here's what, I, here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm asking you not to think that we're doing that just because we're bored and tired of Genesis. That is, in fact, part of it, right? We're ready to get to the next thing. As pastors, we've been studying this book for a long time, so we feel that. But, but more than that, I really do think that by design, that when Moses wrote the book of Genesis, he designed it in such a way that ultimately this would be the way in which the story was read. That this is a narrative. In fact, there are many pastors who would preach Genesis 37 through at least 45, if not 50, all in one sermon. I can't imagine doing that. That sounds terrifying. We're doing four today, and I am in over my head. But ultimately, it is one story. It is one story, and, and, and you've got to understand what happened in Genesis 37 and 39 and 40 and 41 to understand what's happening in 42, 43, 44, and 45 and so on and so on. And so it is one story that's building off of itself. And so we have gone really slow, but we are going to pick up the pace over the course of the next three weeks. uh, By God's grace, if the Lord should will it, uh, we will be done with the book of Genesis at the end of May. So if you've got a Bible, Genesis 42. By way of reminder, uh, as we have been here for the last few weeks, and like I said, you've got to understand what's happened in Genesis 37. Or by way of introduction, if you haven't been with us and it's been a minute, uh, since you've read some of these stories. So in Genesis 37, we are introduced to, so, so Jacob has, has 12 sons. And, and we're introduced to this, this moment where he's picked a favorite, right? He's got a favorite son, it's, it's Joseph. Moms, you, you don't know what it's like to have a favorite. You are just blessed by God to have this unconditional love. But there's something in us as dads, we're just competitive and, and, and different things like that. And so it's so like, we, we might say we don't have a favorite, but we do have a favorite, Right? But moms, you, you don't understand this, and so just understand that, that Jacob had a favorite, and his favorite was Joseph. And he gave him this coat, this coat of many different colors. And, and his brothers obviously didn't like that. There's 11 brothers, and they're going, look at this little punk. He's the youngest, he's the smallest. Like, like, he's a wimp. Why is he dad's favorite? Like, Reuben's going, I'm the firstborn. It should be all about me, right? But not only is he dad's favorite, and not only is he a little, he, he's also a little arrogant, 
uh, a little bit of a punk in that he has a couple of these dreams. And he goes, hey, guys, I had a couple dreams. And uh, in those dreams, you were bowing down to me. And then he comes back again and says, guess what? I had more dreams. And in those dreams, not only are you bowing down, but mom and dad are bowing down to me too. To which Jacob is going, hey, dude, I love you. Who do you think you are, right? And so one day Jacob is, uh, Jacob's, uh, Joseph's brothers are all out in the field working and, and, and Jacob sends his, his favorite son Joseph into the field to go check in on his brothers. And, and as he's coming, they go, oh, look here, here's that dreamer. And they conspire against him. And they come up with a plan to go ahead and get rid of him. To, uh, first, they're going to um, put him in a pit and kill him. But then it's actually Judah who, who, who comes up with the idea and says, why don't we waste him? Let's, let's sell him. Let's traffic him into uh, these traitors. And so let's make a profit off of this man. And so they do. And so they sell him. And so in the beginning of Genesis 37, you've got Joseph, who is his father's favorite. But then you pick up in Genesis 39... And no longer is he the father's favorite. He's now the foreign slave. He's just been purchased by Potiphar. Uh, But here's the deal. Twice in Genesis 39, we're told that the Lord was with him. That God was with him. That God was doing something. And everything that Joseph's hands touched prospered. He found favor with God. It was all over his life. He had success in everything he did, in every room he went into, everything went well, in every relationship he had, everything went well. And so not only is God looking after him, not only is Potiphar pleased with him because he keeps promoting him from chief administrator to ultimately chief overseer of his entire house, eventually Potiphar's wife gets the hots for him. And she goes and starts chasing after him, pursuing him. And so she's going after him, and, 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 and Joseph, being a man of God, chooses to not go the way of the world, to not give in to a moment of temptation, a moment of he flees. He runs as far and fast away as he can, leaving behind him his coat. And Potiphar's wife takes that coat, not wanting to be uh, uh, made to look silly. She takes that coat and she goes up to her husband and says, look what this Hebrew man, this Hebrew slave you brought into our house has done to me. He's come to me and he's trying to take advantage of me. And so... Joseph, though he's done no wrong, though he's gone the way of God's will and rather than the way of the world, is punished unjustly uh, and put in prison. Though he should have been killed, he should have been killed immediately, executed. But God was with him. And we're told that two more times at the end of Genesis 39, that God was with him. And once again, even there in the prison pit, he is finding the favor of God as everything he touches and every relationship he has finds success and favor and prosperity. We said God was with us in the highs and the lows. And anywhere and in between, God is with us. And then last week we said in Genesis 40 and 41 that not only is God with us, but God is working in the waiting. For it had been some time, Genesis 41 tells us, in which Joseph found himself to be in the pit, waiting, remembering the dreams. And God brings before him a, the chief cupbearer and the, and the chief baker, two of, of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt's uh, chief men, into the prison cell with him. And there in the pit, he interprets a couple of dreams for these guys. And, and we learned last week that we've got to be patient in the waiting. And we've got to be faithful in the waiting. And we've got to be confident in the waiting. For eventually, God, the plan that he's working on and what he's working to accomplish will be accomplished. And ultimately, eventually, after a 13-year period from the time he was sold in slavery to the time in which he found himself out of the pit and before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, in his palace, was a 13-year period. And he found himself before the king, interpreting his dreams, and he found such favor before the king, before Pharaoh, that ultimately he became prince. He became second in command, second only to Pharaoh in all the land of Egypt. And so this has been a moment, this has been a trajectory in which... Joseph has been. And so now we start this morning in Genesis 42, and we find ourselves somewhere seven to nine years down the road. I say seven years because we know that we're now entering into the, the, the time of a famine, and we know that there's going to be seven years of plenty, and, 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 and somewhere either between the famine has just begun or the famine has gone at most for about two years, because at the end of this story, uh, there will be five years left of famine. So we know it's been seven to nine years that he's been serving in Pharaoh's court, helping to, uh, to save and, and store up in the days of plenty for the days of famine that were just around the corner. And so we find ourselves here in Genesis 42, 
seven to nine years later down the road. And the beginning of Genesis 42 opens up with this, for, with this sentence, saying that when Jacob learned, so we're transported out of Egypt and back over to Canaan with Jacob and his 11 sons. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, but I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. So go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. And that is a radical transition in the story. There's a moment where like all of a sudden you step back and you go, oh, God's been doing something. It's easy for us to, to forget this, but imagine yourself being a first time reader of this story. We grew up hearing these, these stories in Sunday school. We know these stories. We've read this part of the Bible before. Right, but, but imagine experiencing this for the very first time in your ears hearing that God has been doing something that you can look back and see over the last 20 to 22 years, God has been working to bring about something big and grand and glorious. And ultimately you read the rest of Genesis 42 and you realize this point, that God rescued them from physical death. That God rescued them from physical death. That God has provided a means by which they may live and not die. That they're in a season of, of famine. They're in a season of hunger. They're in a season where there is no food. The land is dry. The land is famine. They have no hope. But all along, God has provided a means that these 20 plus years earlier, when God when, when God allowed for Joseph to, to suffer under the hands of his brothers, he was sending him forward so that he might rescue his family, that he might rescue these people. See, God was doing something in the waiting. He was saving them. That all of Joseph's affliction actually was happening for a purpose. That his suffering wasn't meaningless. That God was working. That God had rescued them from a physical death. And he had provided a means by which they may live and not die. But not only has God provided a means, but God has provided a man. For if you were to keep reading in Genesis 42, you get to verse 6, and it says this. It says, now Joseph was governor over the land. See, Joseph was governor. He was prince. He was the prime minister. He is second in charge only to Pharaoh. But this is unbeknownst to his family. They have no idea who this man is. That God has provided a means through food, but God has also provided a man through Joseph so that these people might be saved, so that they might have life, so that they might not perish, so that they might be able to experience a deliverance from death. And just think about this for a moment. They never would have considered at all that Joseph was the man. Jacob has grieved the loss of this son. Like he has made the Facebook post. He has sent out the sympathy cards, or he's received all those sympathy cards. He's, he's claimed the insurance for him. Like he's done everything there. This has been 20 to 22 years prior. Not that grief ever goes away, but it gets easier over time, right? And so he's at this point where he's accepted that his son has been mauled by the animals in the wilderness. And these brothers of his, like they have suppressed their sin and suppressed their guilt for so long. I'm sure perhaps, you know, a couple of them by chance of uh, a dreams, you know, this isn't necessarily in the story, so this is me uh, adding in a little bit, but just I, maybe they had dreams. Maybe they had dreams, and, and in those dreams, they, they saw and looked down into a pit, and they just saw the eyes of their brother saying, please, guys, help me. Please, guys, save me. But they have suppressed these emotions for, for two decades. They had suppressed the sin and the guilt. Their hearts have been hardened by this. You know how I know? Because because Jacob still doesn't know. They've teamed together to not tell. And they've kept their word. Betrayed their brother. Sold him into slave trafficking, essentially. And so, Jacob tells them in, in the beginning of 42, there's food in Egypt, go. And so they do. And so, by the time they get to Egypt, they stand before Joseph. But they don't know it's Joseph. But Joseph knows that it's them. 
And so he begins to interrogate them to see what's going on. He wants to test them. And so he goes, I think you're just a bunch of spies. You're here to see how much food we actually have. And you're going to come and overtake us. I know what you're doing here. And then they're like, no, 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 we're not, we're not, I promise. We're in fact a large family, and, and, and there's, I think, 10 of us here. We've got one brother left at home, and, we, and our father's there, and then we've got one brother who's, who's died, who's no longer with us, not knowing, again, that he's literally the man that they're talking to. And not only is he with them, he's with them right now in this moment, in this conversation. But again, Joseph is testing them. That, that word comes up two or three times in chapter 42. And so he, what he does is he puts them in prison, he puts them in prison, and he comes back on the third day, and he goes to him. He goes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave one of you here, and so he chooses Simeon. One of you is going to stay here. The rest of you are going to go home, and you're going to get your youngest brother. I want you to go get Benjamin and bring him back. Prove to me that you have a younger brother. And then I'll let Simeon go. And so as the story continues on in 42, uh, they're, they're on their way home, and you can just like imagine the bickering. Like mom, dad, like driving in the car. You just like hear like the kids like in the back just like, like annoying the mess out of each other and blaming each other for all, all the wrongs that are going on. If you're a brother or sister in here, you've had those conversations, right? Uh, right? Right now, we're in this season where like Noelle has learned that she can really annoy the mess out of Chandler uh, by saying these two words, I will. We're like, hey, Noelle, don't do that. And she won't do it. She'll just go, I will. And she'll just go back to it. Like, like and she'll be like, no, 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 Noelle, I don't want you to do it. And she'll go, I will. And like, she'll just keep like just egging him on and he's throwing a fit, throwing himself on the floor, crying, screaming, hysterical because he thinks that his sister is going to do something that she has no intentions to do. She's just trying to utterly ruin his day. And she succeeds over and over and over again. You've seen these sort of conversations. Well, these brothers are here in this moment and they're just like, they're blaming, it's your fault, it's your fault. Like, like we're so good. And they feel like they're under this sort of divine karma, if you will. And they say to each other in verse 21 of chapter 42, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. That's a true statement. Now, it's not divine karma. Karma is, is a thing of, of the Hindus. Karma is not a thing of Christianity. But, but yes, they are guilty. And God is not actually punishing them for what they've done in the past. He's actually been preparing to save them for their suffering that they're currently in. But they said in truth, in verse 21, we are guilty concerning our brother. Why? For, for they have sinned against their father's son. That's what Reuben reminds them in verse 22. Now again, Reuben, in verse 22, seems a little like, I told you guys not to do this. You should have listened to me. Reuben, you were the oldest brother. You had the responsibility. They didn't have to listen to you. You just told them, and they would have ultimately obeyed. Just because you spoke up, but you didn't stand up, doesn't matter. They're guilty, for they've sinned. And as they're having this conversation, they're back and forth, they probably stopped for a water break or something, and one of the brothers realizes that all of his money is in the bottom of his bag, beneath the grain. And he freaks out, and they're all, the text tells us, filled with fear for what's to come. And they're like, oh, Lord, what have you done? I'm blaming God now. <laughs> They finish their trek, they get back to Canaan, they go and tell their father, trying to explain to him that what has happened here, and ultimately they get to this point where they pour out all, all of the grain and all the food that they brought back from Egypt, and not just one brother has all the money, all the brothers have all the money. And now they're in, their, in this moment where they're sitting there before their father, before Jacob, and he doesn't know who to trust. Because in, in one sense, it looks like they've stolen all this grain. And, and in stealing the grain, maybe Simeon died along the way. They're just saying he's left there. Or it looks like they've sold Simeon for the grain, and they've kept the money. Either way, it doesn't look good for them. And Jacob is just brokenhearted. Now, side note, can you imagine being Simeon back in Egypt going, my dad's going to come. They're going to come. And like all this time passes, and you're like, man, my dad don't love me. So you got that going on over there. But like you've got the main picture here. And so you've got this happening. And, and this family's just broken. The sort of things that they would do to one another, they don't know if they can trust, you know, a man as far as they can throw. They don't know what's going on. 
There's all this, this guilt. But God, underlying point of chapter 42 is that God rescued them. God rescued them. Then you go to 43, and you realize not only has God rescued them, but God has actually reconciled them. He's reconciled this broken family. He's reconciled them to a right relationship. For the beginning of, of 43 begins, and it says, Now the famine was so severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought, not bought, because they didn't pay for it, but they brought from Egypt, Jacob then looks to his kids and goes, All right, we're out. Go back. Let's get some more. But this time, Judah goes, No, no, no. We're not going. We're not going unless you let us take Benjamin, the youngest, with us. We've already told this man that there's another brother. He's like, why did you tell him? Like, because he was interrogating us. How do we know that he was going to make us do this? We're not going unless you let us bring Benjamin with us. Because if we go without him, he's going to make us a slave. He, if, he does, if not, uh, just flat out kill us. He thinks that we're spies, Dad. We can't go unless we have Benjamin. We will not see his face. He will end our lives. And this is not going to work. But in this moment, Jacob and Judah get into this conversation. And in this moment, we get a picture. We see from Judah a mercy that offers oneself as a, as a substitute. In Judah, we see a mercy that offers oneself as a substitute. See, he's in this conversation with his dad, and he's going, Dad, I need you to trust me. I need you to believe me. I will go, and, and I will pledge myself on his behalf, for his safety. Listen to what he says. And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me. Remember, this is Judah, the one who in 37 sold his brother for a prophet. Listen to how his life has changed, how he has matured. Send the boy with me. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. The one who suggested that they sell him for a prophet is now recommending that he sacrifice himself as a substitute before his father. He is laying himself before his father as a substitute. This is a mercy that he's putting before his father that we see on display in the first half of 43. So finally, Jacob goes, all right, fine, you can go. And in fact, I want you to take all the money from the first trip. I want you to take money for the second trip. We're going we're gonna to pay back what we owe from the first. And then I want you to give all these grains and all these goods that we do have, the almonds and, and different types of, of fruits and nuts and different things like that, and, so, and bless them so that they know that we're innocent. May the mercy of God be with you as you go and stand before this man. And so in the second half of 43, they get there and they get before Pharaoh. And then it is there that that we see in Joseph, we see a meal where sinners are invited to the table. Joseph gets there, and, 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 or, the, or the brothers get there. He, he lets Simeon out of, out of the prison cell, and, and then he says this. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, when he saw the youngest brother coming, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men, for the men are to dine with me at noon a meal where sinners are invited to come to the table. Think about this. this is, these are his brothers whom we've read about who are rapists, men who have committed incest, men of greed, men of coveting, men who are willing to participate in trafficking. These are awful individuals, sinners. And they are sitting there in his home, terrified. Because they know that they, don't un, they they don't deserve the grace and the mercy in which they are receiving. And so in fact, they actually go on and, 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 and in their fear, they're like, oh, he's going to kill us. We're about to be his slaves for the rest of our lives if he doesn't just chop off all of our necks right now. And so they're in their fear. They actually go up to the steward uh, of the house and they go, hey, let me explain what happened. When we went home, we, we, like, all the money was in the bag and, and like, we didn't intend to. If something happened. They're like, peace be to you, he says. The steward just whispers to these brothers, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. 
God has been looking after you. And they don't even have time to process what they've just heard because in walks Joseph. And they fall and they bow down before him just like Joseph dreamt all those years ago. And they bow down before Joseph and Joseph sees Benjamin, the younger brother, and he says, hey, is, is that the little one that you told me about? And they're like, yeah, that's him. And he gives him a blessing. And in this moment, Joseph is overwhelmed with emotion. And he leaves the room and he goes back to his inner chambers and he, and he weeps. He's getting a picture of what God has been doing. He thought he had been forgotten. He thought he was dead, at least to his family. But God hadn't forgotten him. God hadn't left him. God was working. And he's beginning to piece together all that God has done. And this phrase that Joseph wept will occur a total of seven times between this chapter to the end of the book. And there's a structure there in which Moses is designing for us to see, but but he weeps. He's just overwhelmed by the emotion of the moment. But he can't show that. So he washes his face and he comes back into the room and he says, serve the food. And so they're sitting over here and, and he's sitting over here because Egyptians can't eat with, with uh, Jews and Hebrew, or Hebrews. And, and so they're, they're separated for this moment. But man, he is lavishing it on them. Portions just out of this world. In fact, Benjamin gets uh, portions that are five times greater than the rest of his brother's. And they're just overwhelmed. These sinners sitting at a table of the, of the second most powerful man in the world. Knowing that they have no right to be there. Knowing that they have done wrong. That they have essentially killed their brother by selling him into the hands of the Midianites. It says they were just sitting there in amazement. And the last verse of chapter 43 says that, And they drank and were merry with him. Man, just the mercy of God, that, or the mercy of, of, of Judah to substitute himself so that they can go for them to be able to get there in 43 and be able to share a meal, though they are sinners, to sit at the table with essentially the right hand of the king. All along, God is reconciling this family back together. And then... You turn the page and you get to 44. And Joseph has done something that his brothers have no idea. He's essentially, he's planted a silver cup inside the bag of Benjamin. And he sends his brothers on home. They, again, they still don't know who this is. He says, all right, God be with you. Go your way. And they go home. They get, they get a little bit out of town. And he goes to his steward. And he goes, hey, I want you to go get them. I want you to overtake them. I want you to check their bag. And I want you to bring them back to me. And so the steward goes. He overtakes them. He goes, why would you return this, the, the good that's been done with you for evil? Why would you give evil for good? We have been, my king has been so kind and so gracious to you. Who do you think you are? And the brothers are like, what are you talking about? Like, we, we are literally just like mesmerized that we got to have dinner with the king last night. Like, what do you mean? We have done no wrong. Check our bags. And so they go down from the oldest to the youngest, and eventually they get to Joseph's or, or to Benjamin's bag, and they find the silver cup, and they just rip their clothes as they lament and mourn and grieve, for they know what this means. And they all just pack up and turn right back, and they go back to Egypt. They go back to Egypt. And they know that when they get there, that they're going to be forced to come face to face with all of their sin, with all of their guilt. They know that because of this, they deserve to be punished. In fact, they, and if not, pun, if not punished by, by death, they know that they deserve to be slaves of the king for the rest of their lives. They know that they, have just, they will never see their, their father again. They will never see their, their wives again, their sons and daughters again. They are left behind. They now are slaves in Egypt. They know the faith that is before them. But what does God do in 44? Well, God redeemed them from their guilt. These guilt-ridden brothers have been redeemed by God. For Joseph walks in 
And what do they do? I want you to notice there's three things that they do in this chapter that I think are just absolutely stunning for every single one of us. I think they're instructive for every single one of us. They bow before the prince, and they say in verse 14, uh, it says that Joseph walked in and they fell before him to the ground. Again, fulfilling the dream that Joseph prayed all the way back in 37. They bow before the prince of Egypt, and then they confess their guilt in verse 16. It says that they, they, they say, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak, or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are now your servants, both we and, and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. They bow before the prince, they confess their guilt, and they die to their self. For, for Joseph, the governor, looks to them and goes, no, 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 it's not for all of you. I, I'm not after all of you. I want him. I want Benjamin, the youngest. He's the one who stole from me. The rest of you are good to go. Go see dad. I don't care. To which Joseph or to Judah then goes, no, 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 you don't understand. And he makes this plea, this impassioned plea before him. And he goes, you've got to hear me. I have, I have laid down my life in, 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 in place of this man that he cannot, my brothers cannot go home and Benjamin be still here. If we do that, my father will die of a heart attack, essentially, is what he says. And then eventually he comes to these words in verse 32 and 33 of chapter 44. He says, for your servant became a pledge of safety for that boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all of my life. Now, therefore, listen to this. Therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. My life in place of his. Me instead of him. They, they bow before the prince, they confess their guilt, and they die to themselves. To which at this moment, Joseph sees and hears his impassioned plea, and Joseph is just overcome with emotion. He can no longer hold it all in. And so he kicks out all the Egyptians out of the room, and once the door shuts, he just weeps, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? Weeping. His brother's just standing there in shocked silence. No idea what has just happened. Disbelief, doubt. You were, you were dead. We sold you. How are you here? You, we, you were a slave. What is happening? And, and, and before they could really fully process all that Joseph has just revealed to them, that he is Joseph, that they are safe, that they are secure, he goes on and tells them, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Don't be mad at yourself for that. For God sent me before you to preserve life. 45, 5. It was not you who sent me here, but God. 45, 8. You see, you realize, he says, you sold me, but God sent me. You sold me, but, but God sent me. See, God sent the Son to save them. God sent the Son to save them. And he reveals this, this truth to them. that This is what God has been doing. And they had this conversation. He goes, and I want you to go back home, and I want you to go tell Dad that God has kept the Son alive. And not only that, I want you to go home and tell Dad that God has made me, Joseph, Lord over all of Egypt. And just get the family and bring them all here. I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of. God sent me here to preserve life, to preserve a remnant. God was doing something through the suffering, through the wickedness, through the evil. What the enemy meant for evil, God intended for our good. And he is keeping every bit of his promise. And he, in his providence, is what, his providence sorry, is what is persevering and ensuring his promise. That his promise that he made all the way back to, to Abram back in Genesis 12 is being fulfilled because the hand of God, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God is leading and guiding us. And for these last 20 plus years, God has been doing something. And here I am standing before you as a testament to the hand of God. You are saved. God sent the Son to save you. Shocked. He sends them on their way and they go home. And right before he sends them out, he says, see his wisdom, he goes, don't argue with one another on the way home. Remember, you sold me, God sent me. Don't argue, don't bicker with one another. Don't waste your time doing that. And they go home, they go to their dad, and they said, Joseph is still alive. He doesn't believe him. It says in the text that his heart is just like grows numb, just cold to this this statement that they just said. 
But then he looks and he sees the grace and he sees the, the gifts and he goes, maybe this is real. Maybe God has done something. And he begins to believe and it says that his heart was awakened. His heart was stirred up. And then he just shouts, my son is alive. And next week he'll make the trek to Egypt. This is a story. God has been doing something. But this isn't just their story. This isn't just their family story. This is our story. Watch this. We too are guilty concerning our righteous older brother. Right? For we have sinned against our Heavenly Father's Son, and because of our sin, we too stand condemned before God. And because of the fact that we stand guilty before a holy and righteous God, we should be filled with fear for the wrath of God that is to come. But thanks be to God that when we were dead in our sins, what did God do? God rescued us from spiritual death. God rescued us from spiritual death. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. He lived a perfect life, but he ultimately died on the cross. We find that the cross is the means by which we may live and not die. That because Christ has died, that the Christ... That the cross is the means by which we may live and die. And because Jesus is the Christ, he is the man by whom we may have eternal life. That we may ex- be, be removed and experience uh, uh, forgiveness. Or that we may be delivered from eternal death. And though we are separated from God because of our sin, what has God done? God has reconciled us to a right relationship with him. For think about it, it is the, by the mercy of God that Jesus has offered himself as a substitute in our place. That when Jesus went to the cross, he died bearing your sins, my sins, on the cross in our place as a substitute. He stepped up by the mercy of God. But not only is it the mercy of God, but it's the kindness of God to invite sinners like you and me to come to a table and share a meal with him. That on that day when Christ returns, we will be gathered at the wedding feast of the Lamb and we will be gathered around a table for a meal, to celebrate what God has done in the waiting. And so I want you to hear that. If you're here this morning, regardless of what you've done, regardless of who you are, regardless of your past, regardless of your present, you are invited to come to the table. God is calling you, God is wooing you, and he's drawing you unto himself. So would you come? Because listen to me, God has redeemed us from our guilt. It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters what the Christ has done, that he has come and died in our place on our behalf and was given up his life as a sacrificial substitute so that we might be saved from eternal death, from eternal hell, from eternal separation from God. God has redeemed us from all of our guilt. But here's what we've got to do. We've got to bow our knee before the Prince of Peace. We've got to confess all of our sin and all of our guilt before him and unto him. And we've got to die to ourselves. Bow, confess, and die. And if we will die unto ourselves, then we can be born again anew in Christ. And if we'll do these things, the Bible tells us that we will be saved. For God has given us his son for this very purpose. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. God has sent the son to save us. God has sent the son to to save us, that he was doing something through all those years of suffering and affliction and waiting. God was working. And he sent the Son to save us. And so you look at the story of Jesus, you look at the Gospels, yes, Judas sold him. Judas sold him for, for pennies on the dollar. For he, gave, he, he got some money from the Pharisees for, for giving up the life of Jesus. Judas sold him, but God sent him. And he came down and he lived a perfect life, a righteous life, but he died a sinner's death. He died as he was punished unjustly. He was buried in a tomb, but God raised the son back to life. And God has made this Jesus, whom he has raised, Lord over heaven and earth. And there is coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so, what are you to do with this? See, Genesis 42 to 45 isn't just a story for them, it's a story for us. What are we going to do with this? And so on this Mother's Day 2023, I ask you, do you know the Lord? Like, have you come to the end of yourself? Have you been rescued from eternal death? 
Have you been reconciled back to the Father? Have you been redeemed of all your sin, of all your guilt? Do you want to? Because listen to me, Jesus has come because God has sent him to save you, to save me, to save us. And if we will call on him, then we will be saved. So if you're here this morning and you've never trusted in Christ, here's my, I implore you this morning, be reconciled unto God. Be saved. To, to simply just right now, raise your hand and say, I want to be saved. I'm a sinner. I've, I've fallen against God. I've sinned against God. I've gone my own way. And I'm dead in my sins and I'm tired of going my way because it's not working. I've pursued the things of this world, but they've left me empty. And just say, here I am. I want to be saved. Or just in your seat, say, God, forgive me. God, I believe that Jesus has died for me. God, would you save me and make me your child? And guess what? He will. Be reconciled unto the Lord this morning. And those of us who know Christ as Lord, here's, here's our call. Here's our response. Be ministers of reconciliation. If you don't know Jesus, be reconciled. If you do know Jesus, be a minister of reconciliation. You see, you look at and you consider the story of Joseph. When, when God sent Joseph ahead of them, he wasn't just saving his family. He was saving the nations. That all the nations of, of the earth were coming to Egypt to get food. God wasn't just saving this one family. He was saving the nations. And when God saved you, when God saved me, he wasn't just saving us. He was saving our neighbors and he was saving the nations. So be a minister of reconciliation. Pray. Pray. There's an app called Operation World. Download it every day. You can pray for an unreached people group in the world. There's an app called Pray ASAP. You can pray for an unreached people group in South Asia every day. You can go to the IMB website. They've got a, a little booklet that they'll send you. You can slip it inside your Bible or get a digital version and then it'll teach you and help you and give you enough information so that you can pray for the lost in this world who don't know Jesus yet. Pray. Amen. And give. Give generously to the advancement of God's kingdom. You're going, hey, what do I do? What's a practical step? Will Brown is, is, is going to Romania next month, or maybe two months, I don't know, six weeks or something like that. He's going, Will Brown from our campus, Gabby's uh, husband. Gabby was up here with, with uh, us a few, a few minutes ago. He's going to Romania. You want to help someone go to the nations? He got called in last minute because somebody backed out at Huntersville, and he got called in, and he's, he's going to go. So he's got less time than everybody else to raise money to go. You want to you give and help this gospel get to the ends of the earth? Help Drew and Brooke Tucker and the churches that they're planting there in Romania? Then give to Will Brown. Need information on that? Stop by. Next steps. Come see me. Give me a call. We'll get you connected, and we'll help you do that. We've got a lot more people going overseas this year. We've sent about 40. We've got a goal of 100 before the end of the year. And that's a lot of people that are going to go. But also, we're going to give as a church. At your tithe dollars, I want you to understand this, that every person that goes overseas is, gets a $500 scholarship from Christ Community. We want to help make it possible. We want to help people to go. Because it's not enough to pray. It's not enough to give. We've got to send. And we've got to go. And so we want to be a sending church, and we want to be a going church. You've got people behind you that are sending, got people behind you that are holding the rope as we've got people who are going, who are going down into the pit to do God's work. And we've got people back home who are holding the rope so that we don't fall in, who are keeping us, knowing that ultimately God is keeping us. So what do you do? Be reconciled to God or be a minister of reconciliation. Really, it's, it's as simple as that. And if you need to be reconciled to God and you don't want to raise your hand, look, there's a card in the back of the seats, response card. Just grab it, fill it out. You can hand it to me. I'll be by the doors on your way out. Hand it to me. You got questions about what it means to follow Jesus? Maybe you're not ready there. You're not there yet. That's fine. Let's just have conversations. Let's figure it out. God has sent the Son to save. God was doing all that in the background, unbeknownst to all of them. God had provided a way for them to live and not die. 
and he had provided the person a means and a man. But they had to go to Egypt. You got to respond. Just because Jesus came does not mean you're automatically in. You've got to bow your face before the king, before the prince of peace, and confess your sin and die to yourself in order to be born again to the glory of God. Let's not put that off. Let's pray.